Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Richard Kipngeno, the Birding and Membership Officer at Nature Kenya. Just to let you know, we are starting uh, in around uh, three minutes time. We're still admitting uh, participants who are joining us. So let's just give it a short while. You're most welcome. Hi, my name is e Eli. Okay, I think uh, we now have a good number. Maybe it's a uh, high time that uh, we start our talk this afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, for those who just uh, joined us, my name is Richard Kipngeno, the Budding and uh, Membership Officer at Nature Kenya. And it's a great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you for our today's uh, talk by Stephen Spoles titled How to Identify Kenya's Reptiles. So maybe before I hand it over to Steve, I just want to read about his short uh, bio and how he has been interacting with these reptiles. Stephen Spoles was born in London, but moved to Kenya in 1957 when he was four. He lived here for 17 years in Meru and Nairobi where he attended St. Mary's School. After taking a degree in geology, he worked in Ghana as a British volunteer. Subsequently, he trained as a physics teacher and worked in Egypt, Botswana, and Ethiopia, spending nearly 40 years in Africa. Herpetology is his major interest. He got his first chameleon at the age of six and lost a finger to a buff adder when he was 17. His publications include field guides to East African and Ethiopian reptiles and amphibians, a guide to Africa's dangerous nets, recently revised, and a book about his adventures in Kenya. At present, he lives in Norwich, UK, and lectures in science and mathematics at City College, Norwich. That's a brief bio of Steve, and I will hand it over to uh, Steve to take us through the talk. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much, Richard. I hope you can all hear me clearly, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and good afternoon to you all. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as Richard said, I now live in Norwich, um, but I used to live in Kenya. And I, I really like the Nature Kenya, the East African Natural History Society as it was. They published my, uh, my first papers back in uh, 1973. Um, I'm gonna talk about Kenya's reptiles. It's a, uh, it's a big topic, as you ladies and gentlemen know. <laughs> you're, not gonna, you're not gonna pick up everything at this lecture, but I'll try to, uh, I'll try to sort of give you a flavor of the situation and uh, what Kenya's reptiles are. And I understand that uh, the this is being uh, recorded, so you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to have a look at it again afterwards and remind yourself of what the uh, of what the animals look like. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, may seem pretty simplistic, and I apologise for that. I know some of you are very experienced in the field, but uh, what I always say, and this is something my father used to say, is 
always state the obvious so that everyone knows the same obvious. Anyway, I hope I'm not going to bore you rigid, but if I do, you can always leave. Uh, my program today, oh, just trying to move on to the next slide. All right, there we go. Uh, you can see, um, I'm going to talk about some, some basics about reptiles there, the orders, identification, features and evolution, some statistics. Then I'll go through the families and what the members look like. That's, the, that's going to be useful, I hope. Then some stuff on the zoo geography, you know, how Kenya's reptile fauna came to be where it is. A little bit of stuff about endemic species, a bit of stuff about resources and a little quiz at the end. I'm happy, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, to take questions during the talk. If there's something pressing you want to ask me, I really don't mind at all. Okay, if you want to leave questions till the end as well, that's just fine, either verbally or via chat. I'm happy. The picture, by the way, shows a, uh, a blue-headed tree agama, which is a uh, which is a uh, very interesting lizard, quite large lizard, found on trees in Western Kenya, well, Central Kenya and Western Kenya. Um, sorry, Elijah, did you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, um, I wanted to be in this, um, in this group because I really like reptiles. Well, I want to I'm, be a reptologist when I grow up. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. I mean, we need herpetologists, you know, we need, we need experts and we need people who are enthusiastic about the, the natural world. So delighted to see you here, Elijah. Um. Let's have a quick look, ladies and gentlemen, about some, some basics about reptiles. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> reptiles are ectotherms. What does that mean? They get, the, they get their heat from outside, okay? And they, they're not constantly warm-blooded. They're not like, us, uh, not like us mammals. They, uh, if it's cold, reptiles are in trouble. They shuffle back and forward between between light and shade. Originally, I mean, you know, reptiles moved onto land some time ago, where well, the ancestors did. The tetrapods, animals with four legs, although some of them have lost them. You got internal fertilization. Most of them lay eggs. You can see this this picture here. This is a little spotted bush snake hatching out of the egg. That's a harmless snake. It's quite widely widespread in a dry country in Kenya. They lay the eggs. They don't look after them. There are a few reptiles that look after their youngsters, like the crocodiles and so on. Um, bodies of reptiles covered with scales and they're, they're waterproof. They don't have, and this is the, the thing about reptiles are sometimes defined by what we call omission. They don't have fur, they don't have fins, they don't have feathers, they don't have wings, they don't have constantly warm blood blood, they don't have mammary glands, and they don't have larval stages. By larval stages, I mean things like a tadpole, okay. Um, so <laughs> just a quick reminder, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you all know this. These are not reptiles, these are amphibians. Top left is a frog, the Galam white lip frog, which is found in Kenya on the coast. On the bottom right down here, you've got a rather interesting amphibian. It's a the Taita Hills Sicilian. Sicilians are curious, slimy, worm-like amphibians. There are eight species in Kenya, mostly on the coast or in the or in the hills, the Taita Hills, Shimba Hills, and places like that. But as I said, these are amphibians. And the thing about amphibians is that they have a they have a leaky skin, the water can pass through. So they're they're still tied to water. For reproduction and things like that. Whereas reptiles having a dry waterproof skin are not tied to water. They don't need water except to drink. They can live in dry places. Um, a few points about reptiles, which everyone needs to remember, ladies and gentlemen. Unlike birds, some reptiles are dangerous. You've got the Nile crocodile there, bottom left. That's a dangerous animal. In Kenya, people get killed every year by crocodiles, particularly in rivers, okay? River crocs are dangerous. Um, and of course, snakes, there are a number of venomous snakes in Kenya. 
We've got about 140 species of snake. I'll come on to these numbers later. And about 30, slightly more than 30 are dangerous. And of those 30, which are dangerous, which are venomous, 18 or so have killed people. So you do need a, a little bit of care. That top picture, top right picture, by the way, are the fangs of, a, it shows the fangs of a gaboon viper. Very, very dangerous snake, although quite placid. And it occurs in Kenya, in the West, in Kakamega Forest. This is the snake everyone should get to know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the, the puff adder. It is Kenya's most dangerous snake really in terms of life and limb because it lives in the savanna and in woodland and in semi-desert, in fact, virtually throughout Kenya, except places at very high altitude. And I don't know if you can see, ladies and gentlemen, in the middle of this picture here is a concealed puff adder. I hope you can all see it. It's heads down there. There's the coils of the body. This is the essence of animal camouflage. You know, if you're walking through the bush, you're not looking carefully where you're going, you might tread on it. Well, they come in a range of colors, puff adders, but they're very venomous. They are not aggressive. I mean, no snake is aggressive. Um, and the, the, some recent research in South Africa indicates that in fact, even when trod on, puff adders sometimes don't bite, you know, they, 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 they tend to stay quiet, but if severely provoked, they will bite and their venom causes major tissue destruction. So, you know, some reptiles are dangerous. Got to use your, got to use your judgment, ladies and gentlemen. Um, no, chameleons are dangerous. Quite a lot of our snakes are harmless, you know, but it does require a little care. I mean, I encourage people to go out looking for reptiles, but at the same time, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to meet dangerous snakes, you just need to be a little bit careful. Um, a quick thing, not really about identification, but, but about the evolution of reptiles. I hope you can see my, my, my chart here. Reptiles, animals emerge from, you know, vertebrate animals emerged from the water more than 300 million years ago. And then there was a, there was a division. Um, up the top here, you can see the, the, the timeline of the, of the mammals. You've got the egg-laying mammals and the marsupial mammals and the placental mammals. This lot down here, ladies and gentlemen, are the timelines of the reptiles. And you can see there the various different groups, okay? The, the various different orders and the suborders. You've got the, the chelonians, the shield reptiles, the tortoises or turtles. I'll ex be expanding on these presently the crocodiles, and you'll notice in this particular clade, ladies and gentlemen, along with the crocodiles, we also have the dinosaurs. They're all extinct now, except for the birds. The bir You are aware, I'm sure, that birds are basically feathered dinosaurs. They survived that meteorite impact 65 million years ago, possibly because they were warm blooded. So if you're going bird watching, <laughs> You really are watching reptiles, though. No, it's a joke, but uh, you know, birds, but bir birds share a common ancestor with all the other reptiles. Down the bottom here, you see the, the branch of what we call the squamate reptiles, the tuatara, which is a, a curious New Zealand animal. It looks like a lizard. Then you've got the lizards and the snakes, and they split about 180 million years ago. You've got the the lizards and the and the blind snakes. So. Reptiles have been with us a good long time, ladies and gentlemen, and they are still evolving. They're still changing. You know, variation in, in reptiles is, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got a species that's a bit varied, if the environment changes, then, uh, the, you know, if there are some well-adapted organisms, they'll cope with it. Anyway, leave the, uh, le let's leave the, the uh, evolutionary timeline, the, the phylogenetic tree. Um, just a few pointers about identifying reptiles. Some, some familiarity is useful. And that's a great thing about being in Kenya. You can get out into the countryside and you can see them. You know, you get into the field, you can get a book. I'm, I'm being, uh, what's the word I want? Slightly boastful here, ladies and gentlemen, a shameless plug for a book that I wrote with some friends. It's quite a useful guide, I think. Going to go to the snake parks. There's Nairobi Snake Park. There's Biokenet Watamu. There are other snake parks on the coast. Have a look at the animals. Get familiar with them. 
it's like uh you know some some reptiles you're hardly ever going to see outside a snake park i mean it's not like um bird watching for example where you can go you know a good day in the field especially if you've got someone who knows what they're doing and they um and they uh you can I'd see a hundred species or even more. Um, we're looking for reptiles. You'd be lucky if you'd see 20 species in a day. Sorry, Elijah, did you have a, a question? Yeah, I've been to Bioken and I've held a snake there. Oh, good for you. Well done. Yes, now that's that's a great place, Bioken. And I mean, not only do they do education, but they also um, they're also involved in harvesting venom from dangerous snakes in order to make a decent anti-venom for Kenya. Okay, well, let's let's have a look at some of the sort of nitty gritty stuff. Um, the, the testudines, the chelonians, the turtles, tortoises, and uh, terrapins. Um, you probably know this stuff. All, all turtles and tortoises have got a, a protective shell, okay? They've got four legs, they lay eggs. Um, there are several species in Kenya. I'll come on to that shortly. Turtles, sea turtles. We've also got terrapins, which live in fresh water, and other turtles as well. And we've got four or five species of land tortoise. The one shown here is our biggest um, land tortoise, the leopard tortoise, Stigma chalus pardalis, which is quite wild. As you, ladies and gentlemen, know, if you drive in some of Kenya's wild places, you may see these guys on the road. You know, you drive from Nakuru down to Lake Baringo in the rainy season, you're quite likely to see a tortoise on the road. Or if you drive down to Mombasa from Nairobi, drive through Savo, you might see one on the road. And got to take care not to run it over. They don't move very quickly. But yeah, this is this is the these are the the test judines of tortoises, identified by their by their shell. Now we have the order of crocodiles, crocodilia dangerous reptiles, a bit unusual. Unlike most other reptiles, they've got a four chambered heart. Most reptiles have got a three chambered heart, but crocs have got four, which means they can swim efficiently. They can run a long distance. They can keep going for a fair old while, about 25 species. Now in Africa, we used to say there were three species and the only one in Kenya is the, the one shown here, the Nile crocodile, but um, Recent research has split the long-snouted crocodile you get in Lake Tanganyika into two species, in fact, into three species. No, sorry, two species. And the Nile crocodile has also been split. So uh, we've now got five species of crocodile in Africa, but not by, not by research, but by taxonomy. And this is a dangerous animal. Um, you know, I mean, most of us, we don't worry too much about crocodiles, but if you live in a village in Ukumbani and there's a, a river running near you, crocodile may come up in the night and you know the, the river crocs particularly in the the Athi Galana Sabaki system and the Tana River are quite dangerous they take people every year so you need to be careful if you go near the water's edge lizards order soria so what do we know about lizards most have got four legs although not all okay when we get to the when we get uh, near the end of the talk I'll mention some stuff about some lizards that don't have legs um, but yeah, they've got ears, they lay eggs, they have scales, they eat lots of insects. Lizards are our friends. And in many parts of Africa, even in Kenya, some people believe lizards are venomous, that they can poison you, they can bite. No African lizard is venomous, okay? You'll hear people tell you, especially sort of older people, you know, traditional people say, oh yes, that, that lizard is venomous, or it's, it can bite you and hurt you. It's not true. There are venomous lizards. There are five species in, of venomous lizards in Central America. This one shown down here is the, the Gila monster. Okay, and it, they, they do have fangs, big fangs in the lower jaw. But in Africa, no lizard is venomous. You may safely pick them up, although some of them, some of them do bite. So then the snakes, okay. Uh, no legs, no ears, body covered with scales, they lay eggs. They're all carnivores. You see the picture there on the bottom left. That's a brown house snake, very common snake, which I photographed at uh, the Jimba Caves near Watamu. And it was, it just seized this lizard and fell out of the coral rag. We were underground and it just sat there and swallowed this lizard while we, while we took some pictures. Um, so yeah, they swallow their, their prey whole. Top picture shows a boom slang which is a tree snake, it comes in a range of colors. That's a very dangerous snake. 
snake. It's a big snake too, it gets up to about a meter and a half or even more, but it's completely non-aggressive. And unlike most um, dangerous snakes, it's fangs, it's poison fangs are at the back of the, the upper jaw. And you get green ones, brown ones, olive ones, black ones, striped ones. There's a range of colors of boom snakes, the secretive tree snakes. They have a forked tongue, as you can see in my picture there, they smell with their tongue. Um, if you think you're looking at a boom slang, a cross boom slang, as you can see here, it's an inflated his body. They've got big eyes, got big eyes and a sort of egg shaped head. And the scales are ridged down the middle, so called keeled scales. Okie doke. So uh, those are the, the general orders, uh, crocodiles, the tortoises, the lizards. And the, and the snakes. Here are some statistics for you, ladies and gentlemen, about our, our reptile fauna. One species of crocodile, 17 turtle or tortoise, 140 each of lizards and snakes. All values approximate. And that is because research in Kenya, you know, in Kenya, there has been relatively little research on the herpetology. And researchers are constantly finding new species. Not only do they find new species, but they find range extensions animals that just get into Kenya. And also they, uh, they, there's taxonomic work sometimes splits one species into two. So the values are approximate and constantly changing. This picture up here is one of our East African endemics, an unusual flat tortoise, pancake tortoise, East African endemic, lives in, in rock cracks. And in fact, Dr. Patrick Malonza, who's a curator of herpetology in the museum, did his uh, MSc on these tortoises. Um, they're interesting animals. They are also at risk from the, the pet trade. They're quite hard to see. If you want to look for one, you have to go somewhere like Savo or Shaba, look in, go up to a rock outcrop, and being careful that there's no leopards there as well, and see if they're down in the cracks. Down here at the bottom, we've got the brown house snake, very common, harmless snake. I'll talk a bit more about them later. And then the crocodile top right. And this chameleon here is the slender chameleon, Chameleo grassless. I photographed that one at uh, Kisumu. And they're quite widespread in parts of northern and western Kenya. So let's move on. Let's uh, have a look at the have a look at the the the, the shell reptiles. Here we have the, the Nile soft shell turtle in Kenya, known only from Lake Turkana and the, the Dawa River up there at Ramu and Mandera. It's a big, tur a big tortoise, big turtle, lives in the lake. And the interesting thing is that it's essentially an animal of the Nile system. And that tells us that in the past, Lake Turkana was connected to the Nile. It's not any longer. Down here at the bottom, we've got the hawksbill turtle. In our seas, on, you know, on the coast of Kenya, we've got five species of turtle. Okay, Hawksbill and the green turtle are the most common. And in many places, they breed on the coast. They come ashore and lay their eggs. So sea turtles, and you can see the, tur the tortoise here, the, the, the soft shell turtle, they've got flippers rather than feet. Although they do have claws on their feet, but uh, they're for swimming. Whereas over here on the right, you've got a hinge tortoise. There are three species of hinge tortoise in, in Kenya, Kenixus, and you can see the, the, the groove here on the shell, okay. The, the hinge, sorry. And this animal, when, it, when it's attacked from behind, it can actually fold its shell down so as to avoid attacks from behind. It would be more useful, I think, to fold it from the front, but it doesn't do that. So, so some basic uh, Chelonians or tortoises, ladies and gentlemen, and the terminology we, we use now in America, they just call them all turtles. But in the English speaking world, well, sorry, America is English speaking, but in Europe, we tend to use the word tortoise for something that walks on land, turtle for something that lives in the sea, and uh, terrapin for something that lives uh, in, in rivers, in fresh water. Although we do sometimes talk about, you know, some turtles living in fresh water. For example, the one here, the Nile soft shell turtle. Anyway, all got shells, all got four legs or four flippers. Now in Kenya, we've got several species of hinge terrapin. Down, you can see that one down below. It was photographed at Nairobi uh, National Park. And up here, we've got the, uh, the helmeted terrapin, Palomedusa. These guys are 
relatively small. Their shell is relatively flat. They smell strongly and uh, they live in temporary pools. And when the dry season comes, they bury themselves in mud. They bury themselves quite deep and wait till the next rainy season. And that is why if you're in a place like Savo or Amboseli, you can be driving and the first big storm of the rainy season appears. Within an hour or so, you see these guys running about the roads. And people have a legend, they think they, they fell from the sky because suddenly they've appeared from nowhere. In fact, what they have done, of course, is dug themselves up from the mud and they get into the pools and then look for things to eat. Their shell is relatively soft. And as a result, they don't tend to be in rivers because they are at risk in rivers from crocodiles. Whereas these big guys, the hinge terrapin, there are about five species in Kenya. This is the most common one, the serrated hinge terrapin. These are huge. They get up to about 50 centimeters long. And you can see the shell is very deep and large and it protects it against crocodiles so they can live in rivers. They, now they have a hinge at the front of the shell, which folds up. If you see one of these guys in a river and its shell is deep, it's going to be a hinge terrapin, not a, not a, not a helmeted terrapin. The helmeted terrapin or pan terrapin is sometimes called, sometimes called the shell is soft and flattish. Right, moving to, the, uh, to another order, the, the lizards. Kenya's got about 140 species of lizard. Um, and the ones here, the pictures here show geckos. Geckos are a little bit unusual. They've got a soft skin and they don't have obvious scales like a snake or a, or a skink. The skin is soft with sort of tubercles on it. Um, they've got big eyes and they've got these very unusual feet. If you look at that, my picture here of the feet, I mean, it's got these, these, uh, these sort of flat pads. And within them, there are many, many tiny little hooks called scansers. And that is why these guys can cling to a wall or cling to a, a window. They can even cling upside down. They can hold onto any surface, so long as it's got a tiny bit of roughness. This is the top right here shows a tropical house gecko. You see the salient points of a gecko, ladies and gentlemen. It's got slightly enlarged toes. This guy's also got claws, got big eye, vertical pupil, four legs. These are the ones you see all over Kenya in houses and buildings at night. They come round lamps. And some people don't like them. People are afraid of them. They say if you're if there's their droppings fall on you, you may get leprosy. But that's just that's just a legend. It's not true. And these guys are good. They eat uh, they eat uh, mosquitoes. They do have the disadvantage. <laughs> they make noises at night because they're active at night. They make a little sort of squeak. And uh, some people, it disturbs their sleep. Down here, you've got Prince Ruspelai's gecko. This is a ground dwelling gecko of northern Kenya. We've got 10 or 15 species of ground dwelling gecko in, in northern Kenya, living mostly under rocks and so on. But if you think you're looking at a gecko, notice, ladies and gentlemen, the shape of the head is fairly distinctive. Got a bit of a neck. It's got these sort of lumps on the body, tubercles and broadened toes. Now, not all, not all geckos are active by night. I have some pictures here of um, the Ligodactylus, the dwarf geckos. And you will probably have seen some of these. They're quite common and they're active by day. Although they do have, as you can see in the picture here, they've got gripping toes. They're active by day. That's an adult male. The females are duller. And you've got a, a baby here. And the, the dwarf geckos are, you know, widespread across Kenya, almost everywhere, sort of, uh, you know, below about 1,500 meters altitude. They live in colonies with a, a dominant male in charge. And as I said, they're, they're active by day. They're quite visible. They're also quite hard to identify. There are many different species and their taxonomy is not really fully sorted out. Um, this one on the left here is the, um, it's called Ligodactylus mombasicus, the Mombasa gecko. It's got another name, I've forgotten what it is, sorry about that. Down here on the right, the yellow-headed dwarf gecko. And up here on the right, the, the Kenya dwarf gecko. So look out for these guys, Ligodactylus. If you see one, take a nice picture of it. The, the team at the museum are always pleased to see it. We also have a Facebook forum where we can identify these guys. I'll, I'll mention that later on in the talk. 
now another another um class of uh lizard the uh the skinks um these are shiny bodied lizards and 30 or so species in kenya they've got no obvious neck um they've got pointed snout they live in a range you know in a number of different habitats these two pictures here on the right show the same species, the five-lined skink, Trachylepis quinquatiniata. You can see that's a male up above. The females and the juveniles look quite different in color, and they have these blue tails. Over here on the left, the coral rag skink. This is the one you see along the coast, and it's actually active in the intertidal zone. It hunts, it eats little crustaceans, and you see it following the waves. And as the wave pulls back, the skinks dart down and catch things that have come out of the water. And then as the water rises, they, they dart away. Coming back to the, the five lion skink, they, the females have this bright blue tail. And in fact, having a bright blue tail is something that a number of species of skink do in different places in the world. No one is sure of the purpose. You know, these lizards, the skinks can lose their tail quite easily. Some lizards can't, but skinks can. And some people say the blue tail is obvious and acts as a target. So if a predatory bird is attacking it, it goes for the tail because it's so obvious and the tail then snaps off and the lizard gets away. Other people say it's, um, you know, it's, it's an indication that the skink actually tastes really horrible. And in fact, an American herpetologist I know of tried eating an American blue tail skink. He said it did taste horrible, um, but no one actually knows. Here's a couple more skinks. These guys are, are worth knowing. This is top right here, Kenya's most common skink, the striped skink, Trachylepis striata. You can see shiny body, very distinctive yellow stripes. In the, if you go into a wild place, if you go, for example, sort of up on Mount Elgin or Samburu National Reserve, Savo, you find these guys, they're not so common. You see one once in a while on an acacia tree, but wherever there are buildings, they move in very quickly. And unlike many other lizards, they're quick to take advantage of an urban environment, rather like the, like the yellow-billed kite in Kenya, which is often common around, around uh, villages and things like that. It's a scavenger. These guys are very quick to move on to buildings. I had some friends who built a house in, in Gilgil, and within three, you know, three weeks of them finishing the building, these skinks had moved on to it. Of course, they like it there. They do well. So that's a, an animal worth knowing. And <coughs> some people are, uh, dislike them. They think oh, they, they may carry some diseases, but they don't. In fact, they... they, uh, they um, eat insects. Down here on the right, the variable skink, again widespread throughout Kenya, quite variable in colour, but most of them look something like that. And over on the left here, Sundervelle's writhing skink, that's a, a male, bright yellow and a female, slightly duller. They were photographed in Nairobi National Park. So a lizard that's fairly easy to identify, and if you find something that's buried itself in, in soil or leaf litter, it's almost certain to be a skink, you know, a lizard, I should say, because other lizards tend not to bury themselves. But if you find something in the soil, in a hole, something like that, it's quite likely to be a skink. Nani Guanzula. So now, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the chameleons, uh, lizards of mystery and of much superstition. Okay. And uh, there's 25 species of lizard of chameleon in Kenya, including a number of endemics. Only Tanzania in all of Africa, only Tanzania has got more species of chameleon. And uh, they, vary, they vary a lot. People are afraid of them. They think that they, uh, you know, they, 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 they bring some sort of bad luck. People believe, I mean, I've been in places where people have said, you know, if you see a chameleon crossing your path, especially if it's going from the right to the left, then, uh, you know, someone at your destination will die. So you better turn back. People believe if one sits on your house that it may it may bring bad luck. But in fact, these are all just superstitions. And chameleons are, are very nice lizards. As I said, they eat lots of insects. We know chameleons because they change color. They've also got this powerful telescopic tongue that can shoot at a distance. They don't lose their tail. Getting to know chameleons, this one on the bottom left here, 
is uh, Jackson's chameleon. And that is a species of the highlands and quite common around Nairobi and quite tolerant of urbanization. I mean, you won't find it in the, in the central business district, but you know, in grounds of the Fairview Hotel and places like that, and the suburbs, Lavington, Karen, Angata, you're gonna find these guys. That's a male, it's got long, long horns. Females have got shorter horns or no horns at all. And up to the right here, this is the slender chameleon, Chameleo gracilis, widespread in, uh, in the savannas of Kenya, particularly in the north. They're relatively slow moving lizards. They rely on their camouflage. And uh, they're actually at risk. I'll come on to that in a minute or two. Um, here we have one of Kenya's beautiful endemics. This is the Taita Hills blade horn chameleon, Kinyongia burmii. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the generic name, the scientific name is derived from the Swahili name for chameleons, Kinyonga. Okay, so it has been Latinized and this particular genus, there are nine or 10 species in it, all have the first name Kinyonga. This one is only found on the Taita Hills and uh, Mount Kasigao, but it's, uh, it's a nice chameleon. It's quite tolerant of urbanization. If you go into Wundani town and walk around at night, you can see these guys sleeping in the, in the hedges. I mean, they like it in Gangao forest up there in Taita Hills. But you find them right in the town, in the coffee and things like that. They're quite tolerant of urbanization, so not under threat. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about chameleons is they're active by day, of course, looking for insects. At night they sleep and they show up quite well in torchlight. You can see this, this picture here. Um, oh, sorry, I went, went forward. Let me go back. Um, this is a flap neck chameleon, which is widespread in low Kenya, low country Kenya. And you can see, this is photograph was taken at night. You can see how obvious the animal is, which is quite useful. If you want to do some research on chameleons, you know, reptiles are hard to census, but these guys easily spotted, okay? Which is quite useful if you're working on them or if you want to find one or two, but it has also helped chameleon poachers. Guys who want to collect these things and sell them to the pet trade, they're easy to find. Okay, so it's, that's, a, that's a disadvantage. And although, you know, you can always argue that shouldn't people shouldn't be prevented from keeping reptiles, there is ground for monitoring that trade. Anyway, this particular chameleon's got a sort of big flap on the neck. You probably can't see it in this picture here. Very distinctive animal. Um, let's move on to another group of lizards, the, uh, the agamas. Okay, and these are lizards with uh, big heads, narrow necks, they're relatively large. Um, about 14 species occur in Kenya. And <clears throat> you can sort of split them into two groups. Those that live in, in structured colonies, so-called colonial lizards with a dominant male. This is the male. Here's his female. You can see that the females are much duller. The males have these bright, vivid heads, and vivid bodies and they live in a colony and the, the, the males bask in a prominent place and he moves his head up and down. He's basically saying, this is my place, challenging other males to, you know, warning them to stay away from his colony. And this particular species, the Kenya red-headed rock agama, is uh, widespread in Kenya, wherever there are rocks or big trees at low altitude. Here's another of our spectacular agamas. This is the uh, the Mwanza flat-headed agama, agama Mwanza. You can see the male top left here, he's got this vivid purple head. And the, the female, the female is much duller. They occur in the Maasai Mara. They live in rock outcrops. You can see my picture here on the left. Dominant male basking up on the rock and his females are down below. And he's basically saying to all other agamas, all other agamas in the area, all other males, stay away from me, I'm in charge. So a lizard that is fairly easy to identify, if you think you're looking at an agama, especially one of these colonial species, the males are bright colors. They stand out, they bask in prominent places, thin necks. People are afraid of these in places. People believe, in fact, I, when I was at young, I was at St. Mary's in Nairobi. And I mean, we used to call these things cock and wonders and people believe they were venomous. Because I, I can remember catching one at St. Mary's and taking it home to show to my father. 
And I said, look, I've got this uh, beautiful lizard here. <laughs> it bit me. <laughs> I said, oh, I think it's poisonous. My father said, don't be an idiot. <laughs> and luckily it wasn't venomous or poisonous. Uh, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not dangerous, although some people believe they are. We've also got in, in Kenya several species of smaller garm, which are not so brightly colored. I've got a couple here, Ruppel's agama and the Somali painted agama. These are not colonial species. They live in one, sometimes in two, sometimes a male and female will live together and they hunt on the ground in dry country and uh, they, live in, they live in holes and they're sort of rather nondescript, but they're still attractive little lizards, but they're smaller, as I said, non-colonial. They live in ones and twos, whereas the colonial ones are much more brightly colored. Ruppel's agama, you can see this are rather dull colors, lives right across Northern Kenya. The Somali painted agama seems to be confined to Eastern Kenya from Mukamazi in Tanzania, north through Savo, right up past Wajir, up to Mandera places like that. So you might see these guys on the road in Savo or in Amboseli, just scampering across the road. Or if you're, you're driving from Isiolo to Marsabit, you might see one running across the road. If you walk in the bush there with your binoculars, you might see them sitting under bushes. So yeah, distinctive animals, spiky body, big head, narrow neck, big claws. This is for running fast. They're yeah, well adapted. A few other of our Kenyan lizards, just sort of wrapping things up here before we move on to the snakes. We've got the, what we call the certids or what you might call typical lizards. This bright green one is a little bit unusual. It's the so-called keel-bellied lizard. And the, these live in the Arabuko Sokoke forest and Shimba Hills on the coast. They're very rare. They live in trees. But there are several species of lizard or sand lizard that live in dry country Kenya. And they're nearly always striped. This is, um, what do you call it? Um, I've forgotten its name now. Boulange, just scrub lizard. And there's also uh, several other lizards that look a bit like it. They live in the dry country, the Lacertes. If you see a very fast moving lizard, you know, slim, without a particularly big head, running through the, you know, running through sandy country, it's likely to be one of these guys. Down here on the left, you've got the, the Savannah monitor lizard. Rukenge, and uh, it's a big, it's a big lizard. Gets up to two meters long. Widespread in dry country Kenya. And over here on the right, you've got a, a plated lizard. This is the Sudan or great plated lizard, and it's distinctive. It's got this curious fold along the side here, along the flanks and square scales. And there are three species of plated lizard in Kenya. These ones, the the, the great plated lizard, are very common at the at the coast. And they're quite, they're quite uh, relaxed about humanity. If you go somewhere like Nyali Beach Hotel, hotels in Malindi along the coast, Turtle Bay, you'll see, find these guys living in the grounds. And uh, they're quite, they're quite uh, relaxed about humans. So the, the great plated lizard. Now, this is our biggest lizard, the, the Nile Monitor. Whacking great lizard, gets to about three meters long. Good swimmer, difficult animal. If you want to try and catch one, they bite, they lash with their tails. They can claw you. You can see the distinctive color, yellow and black and banded or with spots. That one was photographed in at Mazima Springs in the Savo West. And this is one relatively large reptile that is doing well in Kenya because they, they like to live beside water. They swim well. And uh, if you build a dam and in Kenya, we, quite a few dams on the rivers for hydroelectric power and also farmers tend to make dams for their stock. These guys will take advantage of it. They run fast. They're not dangerous at all. Although as I said, they can give you a good bite if you try to pick one up. And they have benefited from you know the dams in Kenya. So still relatively common. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, I've, I've zipped quickly through through the lizards. I hope you're all happy that you know what a comedian looks like and an agama and a skink and a gecko and a, a monitor lizard. So we're, we're on the way there. Okay, keep those things in mind. I mean, these guys, these monitor lizards, there's no mistaking them. They are big, okay, they get really large. Let's have a look at the snakes, see what we've got. So Kenya, about 140 species of snakes, seven families, 
Some dangerous, some not. There's an egg-eating snake there, okay, which lives on nothing but eggs. And in fact, there's several species of egg-eating snake in Kenya, including one we call the, 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 the black or forest egg-eater. A picture of one here, the black egg-eater in photographed at Kijabi. And you can see he's, he's swallowed a, an egg. Reptiles swallow their prey whole. And in fact, when they take the egg into the throat, some little spines on the, on the uh, some spikes, processes from the vertebrae protrude into the gullet. The snake moves its head up and down, slices through the shell, swallows the egg and sicks up the shell. So if you keep chickens, ladies and gentlemen, you, you hear a racket at night, one of these guys might be in there, but you know, it's, it's risky going out at night to investigate a, a racket in the hen house. When I was young, we lived in Meru. One night there was a racket in our hen house and my, my father went out and came, he went out with a panga, and came back looking worried. And my mother said, what was going on? And he said, there's a, there's a leopard out there. I'll leave it alone. So if you go to the hen house at night, cause there's a racket, it might be a snake, but it might be something dangerous. Um, this is a green bush viper here. This found in Kakamega Forest. Over there in Western Kenya, uh, you get a number of forest species, snakes and lizards and monkeys and birds as well, and butterflies of the great Central African forest. Just reach Kenya in the West, Kakamega Forest, Nandi Forest. This is one of them, the, the green bush viper. That's a dangerous snake. Although, you know, it doesn't often come into contact with humanity. It sits quietly in trees and stays out of people's way. Um, got two families here of relatively small, harmless burrowing snakes. Um, top right here, the Typhlops or Typhlopidae, the blind snakes. They're chunky, but they're not that big, less than 60 centimeters. And you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the very blunt head and the blunt tail. No other snake looks like this. And they're all harmless. Down here on the left is Merka's worm snake, and I, my thanks to Victor Wasonga at the NMK for that beautiful picture. Um, they're, they're similar animals. They're a different family, but they're basically, uh, you know, they've got a blunt head and tail, and uh, they live underground. You can see in my picture here, the head on the left and the tail on the right. They don't look like other snakes. There are some curious legends about these, these snakes. I mean, some people call them two-headed snakes, and that's because they think they've got two heads. And you can see the tail does look like the head. There are eight or nine species of blind snake in Kenya and a similar number of worm snakes. If you see one and you've identified it precisely, you could safely pick it up. Although you do need to be a little bit careful just in case it's something else, something dangerous like a burrowing ass. But um, they, you know, they, as I say, they don't look like other snakes and they can go, they can, they, they can move backwards, which is why people sometimes think they are two-headed snakes. Yes, Elijah, did you have a, a question? My dad got bit by a burrowing asp. Oh, did he? Oh, God. I'm sorry to hear that. Really, where was that? Um, they lived in Mombasa. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... They also, I'll tell you this at the end of the session. Uh, okay, yes, no, they, they, uh, funny you should say that your dad was bitten. I was bitten by one as well when I was in, in West Africa and I had a painful time, although they're not that deadly. Anyway, yeah, these are, these are the, the blind snakes and the worm snakes, ladies and gentlemen. And I remember once in Nairobi, I turned over a rock and found one of these Merkers worm snakes. And one of the chaps, it was, it was a building site and one of the workers there came over and said to me what have you got there and I showed him this blind snake and he clapped his hand over it, a worm snake rather and he clapped his hand over his nose and backed away and I said what are you worried about and he said don't you know sir he said those things can spring into your nostrils and strangle you it's a legend you know I mean where it comes from I don't know but yeah some people believe that you know these snakes can get into your throat and strangle you anyway they're not dangerous and they they eat mostly ants and their and their and their larvae pupae and things like that and some other invertebrates as well so a reasonably easy snake to identify that you see the little scales they're shiny these little scales go all the way around the body whereas most snakes have broad scales underneath okay secretive animals now let's go from the smallest of kenya's snakes to the largest you've got the python down here up top here, you've got an unusual boa. This is the Kenya sand boa. Fairly easy to identify. You see the, the interesting patterned body and it can be orange, it can be red, it can be yellow, it 
can be grey, but it's usually one of those colours with this, these chocolate brown or dark blotches. Blunt head, very rough, short tail. They bury themselves under the sand and they strike lizards or mice as they go by. Widespread in low altitude Kenya, not on the coast, but you know, anywhere where it's low altitude and dry up around Lake Turkana, the low country around Mount Marsabit. Meru National Park, places like that. These guys are relatively common, but they're secretive. And uh, they actually, like other boas, they give live birth, whereas most snakes lay eggs. And some people are, although they're not dangerous, some people are very afraid of them. Many years ago, I was working in uh, Mandera, right up on the border there with Kenya and Ethiopia and Somalia. My pupils there were mostly Somalis and they knew snakes and they knew the different species, they knew their names and they knew which were dangerous. But they all believed that this particular snake was dangerous. They called it Apris. Sometimes it's called Gilberis, although Gilberis is also applied to a, a black snake. But they believed it was, uh, they believed they were very dangerous. And when I picked one up, they were a bit, a little bit upset. They said, it's going to bite you. You know, I said, no, it's not. Anyway, our biggest snake, ladies and gentlemen, the rock python, and in fact, for years, it was re regarded as only one species, but it's now been split into two. And I think you can all <laughs> hopefully identify a python when you see it, although I have a funny story about pythons at the end. Um, but yeah, they're, they're brightly coloured snakes, and now been split into two species, the southern African rock python, which is the one you get around Nairobi and Naivasha and places like that, and the central African rock python, which is the one you get on the coast and also in the west, and it's more brightly colored. They're big, get up to five meters or more. They can bite savagely. Dangerous to children, so uh, you know they don't normally attack people. I mean, if you're a, a stockman and you see one of these guys near your cows, you need to, or near your goats particularly, you need to persuade it to move away. Um, yeah, so the python, chatu or satu, it's a uh, not, you know, it's not venomous, but big ones are, are dangerous. They can bite savagely. Let's move on to some, what you might call some sort of standard snakes. There's a big family we call the Lamprophidae, so-called African snakes. I just got a couple of representative examples here. There's many, they're what you might call typical snakes. If you think you're looking at one of these guys, it's got a sort of ordinary looking snake appearance. You know, it hasn't got a, it's not particularly short or fat or particularly big or small. It's got an ordinary long tail, ordinary shaped head. This is an olive sand snake, widespread in Kenya, often near rivers, very fast moving. Rear fang, they have fangs at the back of the upper jaw. I'll, I'll come on to that in a second or two, but they're essentially harmless. Okay, and down here you've got the white lip. This is a snake we all ought to know, ladies and gentlemen. They're very common throughout Kenya. They are really dangerous looking snakes. If you find one, it blows itself up. You can see it's flattened its head. See the white lips there, these little white dots on the body. It looks terribly fierce. It hisses, it puffs, it strikes. People look at it and think, oh, that's a dangerous snake. It's in my compound, so they kill it, you know. But in fact, they, they just eat frogs and they're not dangerous, but they do look threatening. So get to know the white lip, ladies and gentlemen. On our website, the East African Herpetofauna, the, uh, not website, the Facebook page, I often post pictures of white lips. So have a look there sometime. I'll come on to that later. Um, talking about this term rear fang, you know, really dangerous snakes have got poison fangs at the front of the upper jaw, as we saw way back with a gaboon viper picture. Rear fang snakes, the fangs are set further back in the jaw. Got a couple of pictures here. Okay. Fangs are set towards the back of the upper jaw. And this is a sand snake, striped belly sand snake. You can see my ring there. That's the, that's the fangs. And uh, they're grooved. They don't have a tube down them, unlike really venomous snakes, where there's a, it's like a hypodermic needle. There's a hole down the middle of the fang. These things just have a groove. They can bite. And the venom is by and large weak. It's been known to cause some swelling and you know, local irritation. Sand, if you're bitten by a sand snake, I've known them cause intense local itching. But having said that, there are a couple of dangerous rear fang snakes, like the boom slang here. You can see his, his fangs at the back of the upper jaw under the eye. And um, their venom is very deadly. But they are tree snakes. They are completely non-aggressive. And if you, you know, the only people ever get bitten by boom slangs 
by and large, are snake handlers, herpetologists who are trying to catch or handle them. They just move away. They're not aggressive. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's the, those are rear fangs. You want to see real front fangs. Here we have a black mamba. And uh, look where the fangs are, ladies and gentlemen, right at the front of the upper jaw. They're relatively short. They're solid. And uh, when this snake bites, those fangs are driven in to a relatively shallow depth, but it's got a really powerful venom. So <laughs> this is a snake you should avoid being bitten by. An old friend of mine, Roy Ann Taylor, poor man died a couple of years ago. He used to run Bioken Snake Farm at the coast. And he had a really nice saying about the black mamba. He said, it's a snake that can cause the biggest problem in the shortest time. It's a dangerous snake. So uh, if you see a black mamba, try and avoid it and stay away from it, ladies and gentlemen. They've got a powerful nerve poison. I'll expand on mambas presently. Um, another family of snakes, the so-called colubrids, ordinary snakes, okay? About 35 species in Kenya. Some have fangs, some don't. Okay, sorry, yeah, go on, Elijah. Um, I, the person you were talking about with the black mamba, he Royal, was yeah. my dad's friend. He, he used to talk to on the phone with him. Oh, and brilliant. He was the one who was really excited when he got the rare burrowing asp. Oh, one yeah. It doesn't have the, the, the very harsh venom, but, um, but will just cause pain and swelling. I see you know quite a little, quite a lot about them, Elijah. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's right. Now, I mean, delighted to know. I mean, Ryan was a great guy, and you know, we're all sort of poorer for his passing. Anyway, um, this snake here, top left, ladies and gentlemen, is Battersby's green snake. Harmless, eats frogs, common throughout Highland Kenya known as Muraru in Kikuyu, and uh, everyone should know it. I mean, in Highland Kenya, people often say, oh, I saw a green mamba, and the answer is no, who didn't? This is the green mamba down here, okay? And you can see it looks very different. There are subtle differences. You see the, the smallish eye, different sort of head shape. It's got this sort of weird smile, and the famous so-called coffin-shaped head. But having said that, they're both long green snakes, so it does require a little bit of skill. It's like trying to you know differentiate between two species of weaver bird or two species of kingfisher there are subtleties there ladies and gentlemen you know if you're trying to describe to someone you know what's the difference between you know a, a dick dick and a sunni you'd have to say well there are subtle differences they're both small antelope but this that and, and so on it's the same here ladies and gentlemen there are subtle differences between them but not every green snake is a is a green mamba and battersby's green snake it's the only bright green snake in nairobi so if you see a bright green snake in nairobi it's going to be one of these guys you can see the the little white spots or little blue spots on the edge of the the scale okay so uh, a snake worth getting to know. It's common in Highland Kenya. Um, now let's move on to some, some dangerous snakes, which are again, worth getting to know. Um, here we have the, the garter snake, the African garter snake. And this is the East African garter snake, Elapsoide loverigii, um, which is usually black with bands here. And you can see this one here being, held by my old friend Jackson Eha. And one of the, it's got sort of reddish bands and white bands. Over here is one being, being eaten by a ground hornbill. Ground hornbills are very fond of eating snakes. And here's a nice red one from, this is one actually from Arusha in Tanzania. But it's a very distinctive snake. They are in the same family as the, the cobras and the mambas, but garter snakes are basically not very dangerous. I've heard of people, I mean, somebody recently mentioned that their dog was bitten by one of these in, in Langata and it died. But if people are bitten by these, you get some local pain, but they're not really dangerous. And in fact, even if you pick them up, usually they don't try to bite. However, we do have some dangerous snakes. And if you wanna, you know, these are snakes you, you ought to be able to identify, ladies and gentlemen. Here we have some cobras. We have five species of cobra in Kenya, three of which spit. They are dangerous. They're bad news. They're, they're secretive too. They usually come out at night. Top left here, you've got Ash's spitting cobra, named for James Ash. Big cobra found at the coast 
and in the dry country of Kenya. Red spitting cobra, which inhabits much the same habitat as Asher's spitting cobra, but is not found on the coast. And here we have the black neck spitting cobra. These guys are found around Nairobi. And because they're secretive, they tend to persist even in the city. I mean, in suburbs like Parklands, Lavington, Langata, they're still there. You know, you might have one living in your garden and you wouldn't know it was there because they come out at night. At dawn, they go down into a termite hill or a deep hole and hide there. And, you know, they're, they're secretive. But they are dangerous. They're worth getting to know. I mean, you can tell a cobra when it spreads its hood. There's no mistaking it. You see the broad, the flattened neck. It makes it look dangerous. And if a predator tries to attack it, it gets hold of the skin and the snake can turn and bite it. That's its purpose. OK, so but if, when a cobra hasn't spread its hood, it isn't always that easy to identify. But you can see them here, very distinctive animals. If you see a snake, you approach it, it puts its hood up. Shield your eyes and back away, ladies and gentlemen. But they're worth, they're worth getting to know. And they have, they have, you know, they can spit venom. If it lands in your eyes, it's very, very painful. You need to wash it with large quantities of water. Sorry, someone got a question? Charlie Disney. Yeah. And, uh, and when I asked him, where have you gone? He said to Fairsy. Sorry, we got somebody's conversation there. Um, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Kenya's two other species of cobra, and these guys, by the way, as I said, are worth getting to know. Red cobra, very distinctive, usually red, sometimes dull red brown. We've got the black band on the neck. Ashes spitting cobra, big brown guy, dark brown and yellow underneath. Black neck spitting cobra, nearly always got a yellow band, sorry, a pink or orange band on the neck, but not always in the Mara. Um, these these snakes occur and they're usually jet black there and they often don't have the band on the neck, although they sometimes do. Kenny has two other cobras. Again, these are worth knowing, ladies and gentlemen. The forest cobra, the eastern forest cobra here on the left. That color phase there is very distinctive of Western Kenya from, you know, um, Rongai, Nakuru, um, westwards across to Kakamega, found all around the lake. Big black snake yellow and black bands underneath. Dangerous snake, not aggressive. It moves away, but it is quick to bite. It's got a strong nerve poison. This is the Egyptian cobra, which in Kenya has a patchy distribution. <clears throat> it's found around Mount Helgen, but also from Nairobi, Thika, Makuyu, south through Ukumbani to Amboseli, Matitu and and then across the border into Tanzania. Okay, and they're both big snakes, get to close to three meters long dangerous. The coastal examples, you get forest cobras on the coast as well, along the coast from um, Shimoni right up to uh, the border to uh, Lamu. They are usually brown. They're not black like this. They're usually brown. So the, mam the mambas. Now, these are dangerous snakes. You're not likely to see them. I mean, I knew uh, some of you guys might have heard of a um, safari guide and ex-professional hunter called Tony Archer. And Tony spent his entire life on safari, or most of his entire life on safari in Kenya. And he once told me he'd never seen a black mamba. So they're not that common. They're not easy to see, but they're quite mm. widespread. Bottom left here, you've got the green mamba, bright green snake. We have mentioned it earlier, found on the coast. There are some records also from Meru National Park and Nimbena Hills. Jameson's mamba over here, found in Kakamega area over in the extreme west. And then the black mamba, which is widespread in Kenya at low altitude. It's not so common in the really dry areas of the north up around Lake Tokana, but all along the coast, all through Savo, Okumbani, Samburu, up towards uh, you know, Kapunguri and places like that. Quite widespread. It's a big snake, reaches more than three meters long. And mambas are essentially highly evolved tree cobras. They can spread a hood. You can see a picture here of one. It's in a cage. It was getting cross with me and it spread its hood. It's got a narrow hood and these interesting light and dark bands. This is a snake, you know, <laughs> to be admired from a distance. Get to know what they look like. Look at the length of that head, okay? Long head, this smile that they have. Okay, and they're, they're not black, as you can see. They may be olive colored, they may be sort of uh, brownish, they may be even sort of yellowy brown, but they're not black, but they're called black mambas, nevertheless. Um, Steve, maybe before you move on, I see there's a 
question uh, someone has raised uh, his and a half uh, alligator and uh, his uh, yep, yep. questions here how widespread are the spitting copras in kenya is it true that some of these copras can fly <laughs> right yeah good question no none of them can fly there are legends about cobras that they can fly but no they can't oh, there are there are snakes that'll jump out of a tree for example the black tree snake going back i'll just go back quickly to the cobras and summarize the distribution for you ashes spitting cobra widespread along the coast eastern kenya parts of northern kenya at low altitude the red spitting cobra pretty much the same habitat but not found on the coast. But anywhere in Kenya below sort of 1,300 meters altitude, you find red spitting cobras, except for the coast. Black neck spitting cobra, mostly in the highlands, but not really high. I mean, for example, they're in Nairobi, but you don't get them at Limuru, for example. So between sort of 1,200 meters and maybe 2,000 meters, you find these guys, okay? So you find them in the Mara, all along the central rift valley central highlands from uh, sort of meru south past Nyeri down to nairobi and then a little bit south of there okay so basically black neck spinning cobra in the highlands red spinning cobra in the dry country ashes spinning cobra dry country on the coast um the maps for these species by the way are we, you can find free copies of all the maps for the distribution of these guys on our Kenya Reptile Atlas. It's a website. If you just type kenyareptileatlas.com, you'll find it. And you go there and look up elapids, large elapids. You'll find maps and text and pictures of all the cobras. I'll come on to that later. The uh, Egyptian cobra, basically, yeah, from Nairobi, Thika, Makuyu, south to the border, across to Matito Ande, and also around uh, Mount Elgin. The Forest cobra in the west, from basically Nakuru, Rongai, Mongotio, places like that, over to the west, okay, and also along the coastal strip. So that's a quick summary of the cobra distribution. Mambas, as I said, green mamba on the coast, but also a few records from the Mbani Hills. Meru, Jameson's mamba in the west, Kakamega, places like that, also known from Logorian. And the black mamba, pretty widespread in Savannah. So all along the coast, low altitude country, there's been one or two records from Nairobi, but basically it doesn't really occur there. The nearest record to Nairobi where they definitely occur is Lukenia Hill. Um, last family of dangerous snakes, the vipers, Viperidae. They've all got these very long fangs at the front of the upper jaw. You can see my picture here, holding a puff at it. You can see how long the fangs are. They are so long, in fact, that when the snake closes its mouth, the fangs fold shut, okay? They're erected when it's open, opens its mouth. You can see a drop of venom there spilling out of the, of the duct. On, the, on open ground, puff adder is very obvious, but as you saw in my picture earlier, ladies and gentlemen, they are well camouflaged. So you've got to watch out for them, okay? When you're walking in the bush, wear strong shoes. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, this is why our farmers in Kenya suffer. I mean, many people farming in Kenya, you know, they're relatively poor. They don't have strong closed shoes that cover their ankles. They're farming in sandals and things like that. And they tread on these snakes. And you want to solve snake bite problems in Kenya, you make sure everyone's got a strong pair of shoes and a good torch and is able to sleep indoors, you know, in a house that can be closed or under a mosquito net. And that way you'll reduce snake bite in Kenya. It's a hazard, especially for people living in the countryside. Um, we've got this family, what we call the true vipers, the African vipers, genus bitus, okay, all venomous, three big, one small species in Kenya. There's another puff out top left, bottom left here and right, the, the, the rhinoceros viper found in Western Kenya, Nandi Forest, Kakamega, Got horns on the end of the snout. No one knows what they're for. And here we have the Gaboon Viper, which is also known from Kakamega area. Very beautiful snake, but startlingly colored, but quite well camouflaged. There've been rumors that they can be found in the Shimba Hills, but no definite records. That would be very interesting. They're found on the other side of the border in Tanzania, in the uh, coastal forests and also um, with some Bara Mountains. So three big spectacular vipers, but th these guys, the Gaboon Viper, Rhino Horn Viper, only found in the, in the West, basically. The Puff Adder found almost everywhere.
it's a hazard. A um, couple of other vipers, night adders, there are four species of night adder in Kenya. This is one on the left, the rhombic night adder, widespread in the highlands, they're frog eating snakes. They are venomous, but not very venomous. I mean, no one's ever been killed by one. And in fact, there's no anti-venom. If you want to identify a night adder, rhombic night adder, it's got a V shape on the head. This one on the top right here, that's a very dangerous little snake. That's the, uh, the Northeast African carpet viper sporadically distributed all over northern Kenya. They're very common in some places. Baringo, you turn over a few rocks, you'll find one of these guys at Wajir, around Lake Turkana. There was a uh, researcher called Alex Mackay, he used to be the herpetologist at the National Museum. He went with Jonathan Leakey down to Moile Hill, which is that beautiful hill north of uh, Ololokwe as you go up towards um, Mount Mars a bit. And they set up camp there and they had their snake catching team there and they collected 4,000 of these snakes in three months. And they took them and they took the, they, they, they milked them. They took the venom. The venom was sent to make anti, anti venom. And then they released them. But they are, they're present in huge numbers. So you ought to know what a carpet viper looks like, ladies and gentlemen. It's a little snake and it rubs its scales together when it's crossed and it makes this strong rustling noise. And they are a major hazard. You know, if you're a Samburu, or Takana, Somali, these guys live in your area and they're a hazard. You know, the reason you should try not to step out at night without strong shoes on. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I hope by now you feel you can identify a blind snake, a worm snake, a python, a green snake, a cobra, a puff adder, a carpet viper. A few quick things to sort of round up on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the zoo geography of Kenya's reptiles. This looks a bit technical, but basically our fauna, you know, Kenya has got probably the most diverse landscape in all of Africa. As you know, we've got coral sea, we've got snow-capped mountains, we've got desert, we've got rainforest, we've got savanna. And the snake fauna, well, the reptile fauna reflects this. We've got animals in Kenya that came from the from the Middle East right down through eastern Ethiopia. We've got animals that came across the Sahel into northern Kenya. Animals that came from the great forests of the west. Snakes, reptiles, lizards and so on that came up from the south. And uh, we've also got our own home ground species, the endemics that are found nowhere else. Um, some example of those interesting animals, ladies and gentlemen. This is Boulanger's pygmy chameleon, a weird little stump-tailed chameleon of the Central African forests. And in Kenya, only found in Kakamega Forest. And that is why it's important to preserve it. It's a beautiful forest with some really nice organisms in it. But these are little guys, they're not more than about two or three inches long. Okay, and they live in the forest there. Here we've got the Somali Maasai clawed gecko, an animal that's typical of Somalia. Eastern Ethiopia, it just gets down into Eastern Kenya. And here we've got the mole snake, big snake. And that came up, so there's a Southern African species that has just entered Kenya in the center. And it's found up the Rift Valley as far north as Eldoret. But you know, these mole snakes, ladies and gentlemen, they used to be very common. When I was young, we used to go down to Lake Naivasha, 1970. You hunted for a day, you could find one or two of these guys. But nowadays, I mean, they get they get up to about six foot long, two meters or more. You know, there are many people at Naivasha and people are wary about big snakes. And these guys come out in the day. So there's very few left. Maybe some in Hell's Gate on the farms along the Rift Valley. Some landowners do tolerate them. But, you know, a big diurnal snake in Kenya is not well tolerated because people think, well, it might be a cobra. It might bite my children. I better kill it. So they suffer. They need, they need protection. Here are some of our beautiful, beautiful endemics, animals that are found only in Kenya. Some of these are found in national parks and some of them are not. And, you know, research effort. This is the guys from the National Museum and the NMK, the herpetologists there. They're always pushing to get protection for these guys, you know. But, you know, people tend to think, oh, well, we need to protect the elephants, yes, and the rhinos and the lions. But, they don't worry too much about the little guys. I mean, this is the, the Kenya Montane Viper, only found in the whole world on the moorlands of the Aberdares of Mount Kenya, and threatened by global warming, ladies and gentlemen. If it warms up, 
these guys, where are they going to go? They can't fly. They like it cold. Okay. So, yeah, beautiful little snake. If you walk on the moorlands, Aberdares, look out for these guys. They're very distinctive. They've got these markings down the back. Little viper. This is the Mount Kenya bush viper, known from three forests only. Up above Chuka, Mount Kenya forest, the Nimbani Hills, especially the northern end, around Ngembe, and also the Ngaya Forest, which is on the way down to driving from the Nimbani Hills down to Meru National Park. And these guys are threatened for the pet trade. I mean, people pay hundreds of dollars for these in Europe and America. So collectors go. I mean, they find them, they, they sell them to pet traders. This is the, uh, the Kenya Horn Viper, found only in the central Rift Valley. Beautiful little snake, horns above the eyes. And it lives, it's found from Kidong north through Naivasha, Nakuru, up as far as Kipkabosan, Eldoret, but nowhere else. Here we have a really spectacular endemic, found recently, uh, Agama Wachire, Washington Wachire's rock Agama. That's because he's an ornithologist, Washington. He found this lizard and we realized it was something new and it was described as a new species. Sorry, Elijah, you had a question. Yeah, how can pet traders pay, trade a venomous snake? Sorry, say that again. How can pet traders trade a venomous snake? How can, the Mount how can they trade it? Oh, well, pe people like people pay a lot of money for them. They they like to keep them as pets, you know. Um, but they're venomous. Well, <laughs> you're, you're, you're telling me, yes, that's right. I mean, they are venomous. Some people keep them. I mean, I know people that keep black mambas as pets, you know. I mean, it depends, you know, but these, these, for some reason, these little vipers are much in demand in the pet trade and people like to keep them and they'll pay a lot of money. And it's a problem, you know, because people will pay lots of money for these guys. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, well, some of us keep dogs and cats, you know, I mean, they can bite you. <laughs> I mean, here in Britain, every so often people get killed by dogs and yet people still keep them. So uh, to each his own. But as I said, you know, I'm not against the trade in these things because for many poor people, it represents a legitimate source of income, but it does need to be monitored and their habitats do need protecting. This down on the bottom right here, by the way, that's the Mount Marsabit chameleon found only on, on Mount Marsabit. And uh, my thanks to Colin Tilbury, chameleon expert, for that picture. So here's something for you to take away, ladies and gentlemen. Often when you see a snake, it's hard to identify, and especially if it's a brown one. You think, hmm, what was that? In Kenya, anything that's got a long stripes along the body is usually rear fanged, not dangerous, and it's quite likely to be a sand snake. Up here on the top left, you've got the striped-bellied sand snake, the northern striped-bellied sand snake, very widespread in Highland Kenya, and you're quite likely to see it, okay? Over here on the right, the speckled sand snake, the fastest snake in Africa, it can go at a real high speed. You know, you try to chase one of these guys, it's hard to catch. They're found in the dry country, all through the dry country and parts of the coast as well. And you'll never fail to identify these guys. Look at the colors, black and yellow, all those spots and the orange head, no getting away from it. And down here on the left, the link mark sand snake, very common in the dry country of Kenya, sits quietly in a bush. You can see the sort of chain marks down the back and the stripe down the middle of the back. And the Kamba name for this snake is Kienda Ndeto, means it likes to listen to stories because people noticed in the in, in Okumbani that these snakes were sitting near their home quietly in the evening. And they, they jokingly said, oh, they're, they're listening to the stories we tell. This is a snake, ladies and gentlemen, you, you guys ought to know. It's Kenya's most common snake. It's the brown house snake. It's not common, as I said, in, in uh, unex, you know, in, in sort of wild country, but it's very adaptable and it copes really well with urbanization. So they're common around Nairobi, Mombasa, Nakuru, Eldoret. You find these guys, most common snake, and they're harmless, but many people kill them and think, oh, they're black mambas. And there was a picture of a house snake once on a, on, the uh, Facebook forum, Digital Farmers Kenya. And somebody said, oh, I killed this snake in my shamba. Do you know what it is? And about 50 people wrote in and said, oh, it's a black mamba. But it wasn't. It was just a house snake. They've usually got stripes on the head. You can see these little stripes here, but not always. You see the one down here, the Watamu snake, no stripes. And here's one with very long stripes. And here's a yellow one without stripes. But basically they often have stripes on the head, vertical pupil, they're harmless. They're very, very common. 
and many get killed in Kenya. I mean, you can argue, I suppose, well, they're, they're so common and they're so adaptable. They're like the, like the yellow-billed kite, you know, or a feral pigeon. They're capable of coping with, a, coping with urbanization. So they're not under any, under any threat. Um, we're just about near the end, ladies and gentlemen. A few quick things. Some resources that you can find on the internet. We've got this uh, Facebook forum, East African Herpetofauna, sometimes called us so East African snakes, other reptiles and amphibians. If you want to join that, you just have to answer a couple of questions. You know, what do you hope to get out of this page, et cetera, et cetera. You're welcome to join there. And uh, also, like, and there we, we there's a team of us who run this page and we're quick to answer queries. If you want something identified, post a picture there. We can identify it for you, usually within a couple of hours, if not even shorter time. We've also got the Kenya Reptile Atlas, free resource. Find it at www.kenyareptileatlas.com. If you go there and go to downloads, there's a lot of stuff. It doesn't cover everything, but it's got pictures of all Kenya's dangerous snakes, all its chameleons, all the uh, monitor lizards and stuff like that, all the agamas, um, quite a lot of the rear fang snakes as well. It's not complete, but there's a lot, some good stuff there. You can download the files, they're useful stuff. You put them on your phone, you've got the maps, you've got the pictures. I mean, we've got 16 different color phases of boom slang there. So use it, ladies and gentlemen, it's free. There's also, whoops, let me go back, sorry. Reptile Database. This is an international website that is slightly more technical, but it lists every known species of reptile. It's got the, the evolutionary relationships. It's got all the families. It's got all the names. It's got the literature. So it's quite high powered, but it's worth getting. Um, some books, uh, I, I, I feel a bit embarrassed, ladies and gentlemen, because those books are all by me and I'm terribly sorry. But anyway, I think some of them are useful. Um, there's the field guide, which you should be able to buy in any good bookshop in Nairobi. I think they're at Textbook Centre and also Bookstop in the Yaya Centre at Hurlingham. Dangerous Snakes of Africa, this is an African-wide thing. Um, natural History of Kenya, that's we've got a lot of stuff about Kenya's natural history, but it's got some things about reptiles and amphibians there as well. These two books on the right, The Amphibians of Kenya and A Guide to the Amphibians and Reptiles of the Maasai Mara, you can get a free copy, a free download from our website, from the Kenya Reptile Atlas. If you go to the kenyareptileatlas.com, go down to the bottom there, go to downloads, go down the bottom. This book is available as a free download. So is this one. Put them on your phone use them in the field. You can get hard copies as well. I mean, I think there's some, the Amphibians of Kenya, there were some hard copies available at the museum bookshop. Um, and this one is available from um, Game Watchers, Safaris. Um, they sell copies at, uh, I can't remember, it's the shopping center out towards Mathega. Um, right, so those are some useful resources, ladies and gentlemen. And also, of course, our museum. You know, the National Museum, there are regional branches with snake parks, not only Nairobi, Kisumu, Meru, Kabanet, um, where they have live snakes. There's a team of expert herpetologists at the National Museum. They live in their building down around the back of the museum. You go down here, around the back, down the hill, herpetology. There's a competent team there, herpetologists, always happy to help. There are snake parks and things like that on the coast. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about there. A few quick quiz questions for you all. Do you know what that is? Is it a crocodile, a lizard, a snake, or a tortoise? You know, don't turtle. you? Yeah, it's right, turtle. exactly. It's the leatherback sea turtle, a huge turtle. There's a very great organization called the Watamu Turtle Watch, monitors these guys along the coast. They recently discovered these guys nesting for the first time on the Kenya coast. Yes, it's a turtle, ladies and gentlemen. So you see your, your identification skills are there. Now, can you tell the difference between these two? <laughs> I'm sure you can. Um, have a quick there's, look. Yeah, go there's on. A, um, there's a puff adder yep. and a, a python. Yeah, well done. That's brilliant. Yeah, exactly so. The puff adder and the python. And we have a, I have a funny story. I used to help out at Nairobi Snake Park in the 1970s. And a chap rang us up once and said he was leaving Kenya and he wanted to give us his pet python. So we said, yes, we'd be pleased to have it. And he brought this snake down in a sack and he tipped it out of the sack. 
into a cage at the snake park, his pet python. And it was a puff adder. It was a huge puff adder, about sort of six foot long, one of those big ones you get up on Lycipia. And we just were quiet. And then the curator said to this guy, he, was a, he used to be a professional hunter. He was emigrating from Kenya. And he said, um, did this snake ever bite you? And he said, oh, it tried once or twice. You know, he said, pythons have a nasty bite. I had to move quickly. So, uh, so uh, but it didn't manage to bite me, luckily. Anyway, when he went off, I said to the curator, I said, why didn't you tell him that, that was a puff adder? And he said, you saw how old he was. He'd have probably had a heart attack. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's useful to be able to tell the difference between a puff adder, bottom left, and a python, top right. Who have we got here? Monitor lizard. And I, and I, you're really on the ball today. Yeah, that's right. It's a Nile monitor lizard, and it's swimming. But you can just see the head and the serpentine shape behind. Looks like a looks like a snake, doesn't it? But yes, that's a, the Nile monitor. And here we have five snakes. Which one is the black mamba? <laughs> Have um, a quick... The one in the middle of... I mean, right. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Well done, sir. Yeah, exactly so. Um, this, is a, this is a black tree snake, or Schmidt's black tree snake, or the, sorry, the Meru tree snake found in central Kenya. Bottom left here, house snake, black one. This is an olive sand snake, top right. Here we have the black mamba. He's not black. Down here, we have a black spitting cobra. This is from the Mara. It's a black neck spitting cobra, but in the Mara, you get ones that are all black. And uh, I once posted these pictures. You know, in Kenya, people tend to see a black snake and they think black mamba. Okay. And I once posted these pictures on Digital Farmers Kenya. And I said, who knows which of these snakes is the black mamba? And I think people were confused. And after a while, somebody said, I don't think these snakes are found in Kenya, but they are, ladies and gentlemen. But yes, it's worth knowing. You see the black man there. He's got the smile, the so-called smile of death. Um, three similar skinks here. And this is severe stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Top right, striped skink, very common. Left hand here, the variable skink, also pretty common. Bottom right, uh, the tree skink. Trachylepus planifrons, widespread in uh, dry country Kenya. Okay, here we got two snakes. One's dangerous, one's not. Which one would you would you not want to pick up? The one on the right. <laughs> uh, Elijah, that's your first mistake. You got them all right up till now. Now the one on the right is actually harmless. It's an egg eater. It's an egg eating snake. Whereas the one on the left is a rhombic night adder. And you can see, ladies and gentlemen, there are subtle differences here, okay? But if you were describing it, you said it's a brown snake with a V-shape on the head. That fits both of them, and with blotches down the back. And you can see the blotches. So it's a subtle skill. It's like the difference between a Land Rover and a Toyota Land Cruiser. If you know your cars, you say, well, that's easy. But if you don't know cars, it's hard to describe the difference. Two interesting lizards in Kenya. Both without legs. <laughs> this one up top left is Percival's legless skink, and it's found in Savo. It lives under the soil. Down here on the right, we've got the Voy wedge snouted worm lizard, which is again is a weird burrowing lizard without legs. So, ladies and gentlemen, not all uh, not all lizards have legs. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I think we're just about at the end. If anyone's got any questions. I'm delighted to answer them. Uh, if not, <laughs> thank you very much for listening to you. Hello, I'd like to ask. Yeah, go on, sir. Uh, um, the the voy legless lizard that you just showed now. Yeah. How close is it to what they call the Sicilian? Oh, that's a good question, because it, it looks just like a Sicilian, doesn't it? You're right. And in fact, they're in a, a totally different uh, class. You know, the Sicilian is basically an amphibian and it's got, a, you know, yes. wet skin. Um, although it is a vertebrate, whereas the legless lizard is a reptile. So although they look very similar, and in fact, I think in the Taita Hills, they use the same name for both of them. But in fact, they are, they're two totally different classes. One's an amphibian and one's a reptile tile although they look they look rather similar so yes yeah, okay. question 
Thank you. This is the first time I'm hearing about the legless lizard. <laughs> right, I knew well, about the Sicilian. All right. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, they, they occur in the same sort of area, although the Sicilian, of course, is in the hills, whereas the legless lizard is down in, down in their dry country. Okay, thank you. And you're most welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Just a quick look at the chat box. I see a question from uh, Jacinta and Jerry, and she's asking, how has urbanization in Nairobi and its environs affected the distribution of the species found in the areas? Yeah, sharp question. I mean, basically, um, humans and reptiles don't coexist well. I mean, in a central business district in Nairobi, you know, down near Moy Road, Uhura Highway and so on, nothing very much lives there any longer, simply because it's too polluted and there's too little wild country. In the suburbs, you know, you've got leafy suburbs like sort of Spring Valley, Lavington, Langata and Karen. A lot of stuff persists there. But, you know, things there used to be pythons there. There are probably not any longer. But, you know, there are pythons still in Langata and Karen. Jackson's Chameleon, for example, still pretty widespread in, 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 in the suburbs of Nairobi. But as people come, you know, when you go somewhere like Kibera, you're not going to find very much there. There may be a few geckos and a few skinks. Around the dams, you'll still find some frogs and things like that. But yeah, animals, but reptiles are not, re you know, especially large ones, are not really compatible with humanity. I mean, that would make a good project to study how urbanization affects the wildlife, especially since you've got some absolutely pristine landscape in Nairobi National Park. I mean, you go to Nairobi National Park, do a bit of research there. I mean, the, the, the team from NMK, I know, have done some work there. Basically, what you can find there is that the reptiles and amphibians that used to be there before there was any urbanization. Then you move to a suburb like Lavington or Parkland or somewhere and uh, investigate there, see what's left there. You know, the, the, the fauna has basically become much sort of poorer because humans don't coexist well. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, you know what we say in Kenya, nyoka ni nyoka, okay? You see a snake, people think, ah, it's dangerous. I, you know, I have children, I mustn't leave it. So they tend to kill it. So they don't, they don't coexist well, but some species can, can exist. Great, thank you so, very much. There you go. For, nice. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for that elaborative uh, explanation. Uh, I see uh, Rupi Mangat uh, say, Wow, Washington found a new species of a gamma lizard. I see apologies of uh, Nadine Ospel cows that they had to leave. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you. Uh huh. Rupi Mangat, Stephen, thank you, and always look forward to your talks. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, Edward Orieto, Asante Sana, this was awesome. Uh, I couldn't thank you, Lawaki, great, thank you. Alligator, awesome presentation and very enlightening. Have a gross, excellent, and informative, uh, informative presentation. Many thanks to Stephen Spouls. And uh, there's another question here from Alligator. I am sure that legless lizards are confused for blind snakes. Is this possibly the case? Yeah, yes, they are. Yep, they are. I mean, when people see a legless lizard, I mean, even here in Britain, we have a legless lizard called a snow worm and people think it's a, think it's a snake. Yeah, they see a wriggling reptile with no legs and they say, yep, it's a snake. In fact, they, they don't go as fast as snakes, but they, yeah, they do get, they do get confused. Okay, um, great. Um, I see there's a question here about how long do the burrowing tortoises survive alive? Yes. And the answer is, <laughs> people don't really know. Um, I do know that if you don't allow them to hibernate, they don't live so long. I would think they usually live about 20 or 30 years, mm. possibly more. Tortoises are long lived. But I'm, I remember once someone in, in, in America told Alex Mackay, they kept the hingeback tortoises and they said they never lived more than about six years. And Alex knew that in the wild, they lived at least 20 years. And he said, well, if you don't let them burrow, they're living life at full throttle all the time. Their lives are shorter than if you allow them to burrow because they're, they're buried underground for sort of half the year. Oh, so uh, excuse me, let me just extend that a little bit, uh, if you may. Yeah, uh, go ahead. If there is a prolonged drought, as sometimes happens to be the case, can they continue for, say, an entire year of no rain buried underground? 
Well, that's a, that's a good question. No one really knows. Um, but I do know there were some frogs, for example, there's this very big frog in eastern Kenya called the bullfrog. And I've heard of cases where they have remained buried underground for seven years. Okay, so I would think the tortoises can live at least a couple of years, you know, they go underground or they go deep into a rock crack and then just basically remain there until the rain comes. Okay, great, Steve. I, okay, I have, I see a question here from uh, Rupi Mangat asking, can you do a safari for snake lovers? <laughs> It'd be a pleasure. So long as once the, once the coronavirus has faded, yes. <laughs> okay, great. I should, nice. I should like to do that, yeah. <laughs> Helido Yeke, great and informative. Uh, many thanks, Steve. Oh, it's just it's and Jerry, thank you, Paul. Yeah. I enjoyed the session. Yeah. Uh, from Alligator, that was well answered. Arupi is asking, have you found anything recently in Kenya? Well, I haven't been in Kenya since 2019 because of the coronavirus. But in, in 2019, I stayed on um, at Sabache Camp near... Samburu and we found an interesting frog there. There was a big rainstorm and we went out at night and we found a frog called the, um, the northern ornate frog which isn't recorded from that area of Kenya at all. One day soon I shall publish something about it and it's known from Savo and it's also known from Ethiopia but there are no records from the north but you know it's a while since I've been in Kenya so I'm just waiting for the restrictions to lift so I can get back. Great, we'd really love to see you back in Kenya. <laughs> and uh, Elijah, actually the man of the match is asking, what is the easiest to use up to identify reptiles? Um, I don't know if there is one actually. I know some people have been working on one, but I don't, I don't know of an app to identify reptiles. There are several forums on Facebook. For example, the one I mentioned there, our East African uh, snakes and other reptiles that's quite you know we identify snakes there but i don't know of an app I mean, we don't have anything like the like the plant app you know or the, or the bird finder thing so no okay elias Mina, thanks steve for that good presentation uh like that oh wow. and there is a question here from ronnie mwangi i see he also tried raising up his hand what are some of the descriptive characteristics that are used to distinguish between a sicilian oh sorry and a and, uh, lizard? yeah they <laughs> they look very similar but there's two things one is You'll find a Sicilian in a, in, in a moist area and a legless lizard in a dry area. And if you pick them up, the lizard feels dry and a Sicilian feels slimy. And that's a way of telling them apart. Okay. I see Alex Hunter. Thank you so much, Mze. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. And Rupi so, Mangat. Uh, well, that might have been Edwin coming back. <laughs> Well, oh, thank, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Rupi is uh, asking, if we have more reptiles researchers in Kenya, will it better their status? Yes, I mean, anything that anything that basically, um, you know, makes people more familiar with it is helpful. I mean, you know, what I think, you know, the way forward with something like this would be to teach a bit of herpetology in schools, you know, in, uh, in, in year sort of 10 or 11. Teach, um, teach the students a bit of stuff about reptiles and amphibians, you know, where they're found, which ones are dangerous, what Kenya's got, you know, wouldn't be too difficult, produce a little handbook, send it out to all the schools. People get familiar with it. I mean, people are frightened of animal, you know, reptiles because they're unfamiliar with them. And of course they are, there are dangerous snakes. Familiarity is what matters. You teach it in schools. You just need a, you know, a couple of hours course a year but uh, it would make people much more sort of well disposed towards reptiles. Many people don't know that reptiles are beneficial. You know, they don't know that reptiles eat insects and things like that. And they don't know that, you know, no lizards are dangerous. So basically, uh, yeah, um, familiarity is the important thing. I mean, as Rupi's mentioned here, the, the, the stuff that's been in Combo, you know, the, the magazine, um, you know, that's any, anything that makes people familiar. So, yeah, and I mean, you know, if you've got children, take them to snake parks and places like that. Take them to wild places. This is the way forward. Uh, 
I mean, Kenya's got a very, very rich reptile and amphibian fauna. At the same time, it's got a rapidly growing population and um, relatively, uh, you know, uh, the wild places are disappearing as people need, people need places to live. So uh, the more we can get familiar with them and the more we can sort of avoid persecuting them, the better. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Atukwa Howard is uh, saying, thanks, Paul. I have really learned a lot. Right. Right. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you. So I have uh, gone through the whole chat box and I think uh, we do not have any other question that uh, we have left uh, unanswered. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Christopher, we have the facts. Okay. Yeah. So, is there someone who is trying to uh, ask a question or uh, is that a different discussion, maybe? I, I couldn't quite, I couldn't hear that. It was sort of quite broken up. Okay, great. So if there is, if there is no any other question, uh, this is just to thank each and every one of you for creating time to join our members monthly talk. Thank you very much, and uh, we really look forward to uh, hosting Steve Spalls again for in the near future for another comprehensive uh, talk about reptiles. Uh, one announcement that I have to make is that uh, our bird walks are still on, and uh, next week on Wednesday we are meeting at the museum. We are doing it at the museum uh, grounds and Michuki uh, Memorial Park. And uh, for the month of July, uh, the communication will be in the NatureNet newsletter that will be released next week. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for joining us in our today's talk and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're most welcome. Actually, the participants can leave uh, at their pleasure. Maybe Steve, you will remain behind shortly. Sure. Actual okay. service. Thank you. Bye, everyone.